Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited to be here. It's my first time in Adelaide. And uh, yesterday evening, I had the pleasure to taste some of your wines. So hopefully today I'll be OK in the presentation. Uh, but I really felt the warmth of the, <coughs> of the South Australia people, which I really like. And um, I want to see also if, if you guys have been to Israel before I start talking a lot about the country. So maybe can I have just a raise of hands, whoever has been in Israel? OK, we need to work on that, but it's a, it's a good start. Thank you. OK, so what, what I'll do is I'll start with a presentation uh, about the Israeli startup nation and how we got to where we, where we are now. And uh, I'll also try and see a little bit how it works in a specific model, which is the incubator model, which we run, which we as Terra run it. And also at the end, I'll try to give a little bit of an uh, agro focus. We are in an agro uh, conference. And maybe give some tips about you know, what we learned from all this process. So I'll try to be brief, but please bear with me. So I'll start a little bit with the numbers. I mean, you know, many of you don't know Israel. Uh, by the way, Israel is about 9 million people. Uh, I understand it's about 2% of South Australia in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of space, so quite dense. Uh, and in this density, we have a lot of high-tech happening. So you can see here some of the numbers. Uh, we have about uh, 350 multinationals that have set up shop as R&D shop in Israel. We have about 8,000 startups. So you can do the math, it's about one per 1,000 population. Uh, more than 100 VCs. I think that the latest number I have is 200 VCs, which of course is a great help for the ecosystem. Um, about $8 billion is invested every year in startup in Israel. The good thing is the number grows every year. So in the last five years, we had about 30% growth rate in this number, which is great for the economy. And the most important, at least for us VCs, for us investors, is that we have also about $11 billion of exits. So the model works. You have about $8 billion coming in, even I mean, last year was $6 billion, and about almost double it actually goes back to as a return to investors and founders, which is a very important thing to continue the loop. We're one of the highest number uh, of companies on the NASDAQ after China. We're very good at patents. And of course, we have a very uh, sophisticated and talented workforce with uh, number one uh, in the world in terms of engineers and scientists per capita. So that's a little bit about the Israeli startup nation. And here you see some of the companies that have uh, taken shop uh, in Israel. How does it work in terms of the impact on the economy? Uh, well, it's actually not that many people. It's only about 8% of the population working there. We're trying to increase this number. It's a key uh, issue for the government really to try and expand this number to as many people as possible. Uh, it's about 12% of business uh, GDP, but most importantly, it's about 43% of exports, uh, which means that most of the value add that is produced in Israel is actually in the high tech world. And of course, being such a small country, exports are really critical for the growth and the well-being of the nation. Uh, if you look at it on a, on a global base, uh, of course, Israel is number one in terms of VC dollars per capita. So you see on the left, this is actually a European uh, focus, but you can see the, the US as well is there. So we're about, uh, I would say, two, three times higher than the US, which is the second in terms of dollar per capita. On the right side, you actually see it in absolute value. And I made also a piece for Australia. Sorry, my, my graphics are not great but I added it there. So my calculation was that you were about, um, you had about $80 per, per person um, for 25 million people. So as you can see, Israel is, it has a pretty much the similar uh, size of uh, Germany, UK, and France, which of course are about uh, six, seven times uh, as big. So there's a very nice ecosystem. Uh, one of the other things that you might not know is that Israeli technologies are really being used on an everyday life almost by everybody. Here you have some examples. I won't go into all of them. You might be familiar. We, of course, we have antivirus, the firewall that you have in the computer. These were started in Israel. The automotive mobili, which is the system to, uh, to find if there is a car around you, alert system. Uh, voice over IP was invented in Israel, so all the Skype and chat and uh, it started actually by an Israeli company, Vocal Tech, about 30 years ago. And the chatting was started by uh, Mirabilis, 
which is a company in the 90s that was then sold to AOL. Uh, and the discount key, of course. We have a lot of medical technologies. It's, uh, you know, the slide is too short to make it, uh, to, make it uh, uh, to see all the, all the companies. And the other thing which is very important, especially important for you, is the, what we call the clean tech angle or the agricultural clean angle. Most of you know drip irrigation, which of course is a technology started in Israel about uh, 60 years ago, and it's still now about 80, 90% of market share is still with Israeli companies. Uh, desalination, we are one of the countries with the highest desalination uh, in the world. We now have about 50% of our water needs done by desalination. And by the way, it basically solved the water problem of Israel. I mean, now it's just a matter of cost. I mean, we could actually use all the water from desalination if we just, we just have to pay for the water and for the energy and, uh, and, uh, and of course the money to bring it. Um, the other thing we do, wastewater treatment. I understand you also do a lot of wastewater treatment here. In Israel, we have about 85% of our wastewater is recycled into agriculture, which of course is a big issue for Israel and for you guys as well, so that's a good point to start. And solar thermal it was also invented in Israel and is quite well known. Now solar PV has taken over, but it's, uh, it was an interesting start. Um, one of the things that is really very important uh, for the Israeli ecosystem is that it has attracted in the years a big number of multinationals. So you see here from the 60s, we have Motorola, IBM, Intel came, came to us. And in the last 20 years, you see really the exponential growth. Uh, we have uh, about 350, almost 400 now, uh, multinationals that came to, to do their R&D in Israel. Most of them started by buying a startup. So it's really a, a full system with the startup system. And as you can see on the right side, uh, you know, most of the first companies were US companies because of the great relationship with FDAS. But in the last uh, few years, we really have a lot of Asian companies as well coming to Israel. And that's a really big trend, which is really growing in the, next, uh, uh, in the last few years and hopefully going to continue in the next, uh, in the next few years. So I started to, you know, a lot of people ask me, how come? Why Israel, such a small country, you know, such a, so many problems, actually managed to do it? And then the first question, the first answer I give is that it's a little bit about the culture. I mean, Israel has been in uh, some, some tough situations, and this has really created a, an interesting uh, combination of factors that made it a very good place to do a startup nation. So first of all, it's a very informal place. I mean, the ones who've been there know we call our prime minister, BB, our former uh, minister of defense, Boogie, so all these nicknames. So this is really, and this is really not just in politics, it's really all around. It's a very, very informal place, and this helps a lot to bring up uh, innovation. Uh, we have great international network, great experience, meaning that a lot of the Israelis go out uh, globally, and they return to bring their own expertise back to the country. It's a critical uh, factor of success. We have risk taking is endemic. Unfortunately, we have some risks around the, uh, the nation, and so we are quite prepared to take risk also in business. Uh, there's still a pioneering ethos. I mean, we've been there for 70 years, but still a lot of the new immigrants that come have still this will to change the world and do some things. And so we have still this, this idea, you know, it used to be that they were growing oranges, the pioneers or the immigrants when they came, and now they are going into high tech. Uh, it's a small country, so everyone, we just make two phone calls and you get pretty much everyone, including the prime minister and, uh, and others. A little bit more culture, so uh, as you've been, if you've been there, you know, authority is not really an important thing. In Israel, it's a very, very flat, everybody speaks his mind, and this is a great, great way to bring new ideas into the, into the place. So an open, an open place where everybody can say, from the small worker to the CEO, pretty much at the same level, it's a great way to bring new innovation. In most startups, the big ideas come from the team and not from the top management. Sorry, Mark. So, <laughs> um, the other thing which is very important, that's why I put it in black, is you always get a second chance. That I think it's, you know, if it's one thing that I really try to push other countries to, to try and get into their minds, is really the way to give, you know, people have to be able to fail, have to be able to come back from the failure, learn 
and then go to the next uh, opportunity. That's a critical, critical point for the success of, uh, uh, of any company and definitely for a startup. And, uh, and you know, for us, it's much more important to have an entrepreneur that has done it a few times, even if it failed the first time, than a, a person that is just the first time that is doing it. Because of course you have to learn from your mistakes and hopefully you don't make them again in the next startup. Um, the other thing is because of the, uh, there's so many now entrepreneurs, it has become really like a, a national sport. So I would say like your rugby, you know, people are really uh, excited to be an entrepreneur. There's a lot of, you know, the, the moms are happy that the kids can be an entrepreneur. And that's very important to continue the, so beyond the, the culture, uh, the other thing which is, you know, it's, it's not just one factor. There are many factors that create a full ecosystem. Um, what I mentioned before, the number of uh, scientists and engineers to have a really good, talented, and educated population is critical. We had in the 90s about a million Russian immigrants, uh, former Soviet Union immigrants, that came to Israel. That was a big boost to the economy, but in general, to have a strong, talented, um, educated uh, young people is critical to, to running a startup a start nation. We have a really good universities. Um, we have a lot of links. We discussed actually with many of you uh, yesterday now how to bring the link between very good ideas coming from academia into becoming a high tech company startup. It's not easy. Also, we took a long time to develop this process, but I think you have a good, very good chance to do it if you make it well. Um, as I mentioned, multinationals are very important. The multinational role is, is doubled. So first of all, it creates a full ecosystem in Israel. So whenever we need to partner with another company, we don't need to be, go very far. We have the company here. We don't have to travel to the US all the time. And the second thing is for training for our uh, young students. So once a young student finishes college, he usually goes to the multinational. He learns how the um, how the business is done, and then he starts his own company. It's important, of course, that then they leave the multinational to start a company, but uh, in Israel they're very entrepreneurial. There's a full financial ecosystem, so pretty much at any stage of a startup, you have money available. Uh, from the beginning, you have angels, accelerators, incubators, venture funds, and a lot of grants from the government. That's really critical because then at, the, at each stage, entrepreneur can grow. And of course, we have also banker, lawyers, accountant. So anybody that is in the field can really have the help, the expertise on the specific needs they have. Uh, there is a unique role of the army. Of course, the, the army is a key part of uh, Israel uh, society. And uh, beyond the fact that a lot of the top entrepreneurs come from the elite units in the army, there's a lot of technology also that started in the army and then got into the civil world. So that's a critical component. And of course, the government has been extremely helpful. I'd like to touch a little bit more on this topic. I think here we have um, a few people that might be interested. So <clears throat> let's see how, how the government helped in, uh, in Israel to push the ecosystem. The first program was Yozma, which was basically the seeding of VC funds in 94. So they were able to, just by putting about $100 million into the economy, which by the way, they all recouped. So the government invested and then return all the money. They managed to set up 10 VC funds for, with external help, and that really created the whole VC ecosystem, venture capital ecosystem in Israel, which is very critical. We have the incubator program, we'll, tell, we'll talk about it a little bit later. We have grants pretty much at any stage. So an entrepreneur that comes, uh, it can be from, from a university, it can be alone. Any time of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of his life, he'll have a potential to apply for a grant from the government and that's very critical. Uh, there's also grants, R&D grants for traditional companies that want to innovate, which is also very important to try and push this technology not just in the high-tech world, but also in the low-tech world. Um, and one of the things which is very important is the bilateral. So we have, we have quite a few uh, countries in the world and states in Australia, I don't know if we have it with South Australia, if we do, okay. So bilateral grants where basically a company here and a company in Israel can do a joint project and get about 50% matching of the, of the money. Uh, the other thing which is very important, and I think it could be useful for one of the issues we discussed here, is the pilot matching program. 
which is basically in specific sector, the government will give you 50% of the investment in doing a new beta site, a new pilot. And I think for agriculture, this could be very, very interesting because it reduces significantly the, the, the cost for the buyer. And of course, it brings a big incentive for the two to work together, even if the technology is not yet ripe. Um, the other thing we have, of course, is no taxation for foreign investor in Israeli startups and VCs, which is very, very important. Uh, maybe, I, I'm not sure you see this, this properly, but just to show you that it takes time. I mean, we started all this process in 69. In 84, we had the R&D law, and uh, uh, 91 was the start of the incubator, 93 was the OSMA. So there is really a process that has taken about 30 years. So it's not, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's a really good way to, to see how the government can help and also can change the process in time. So every, every five, 10 years, they actually change the program to become more suitable to the, to the state. And these are some of the criteria for uh, a good management intervention. Uh, the, the top management of this innovation authority, which is the one leading the, uh, the help of the government, comes actually from the industry. They don't come from the government, they're not politicians, they're industry people that came into the government. That's very critical because they really understand how the industry works. Uh, the matching that the government does goes down with risk. So at the beginning they can go to even 100% of the matching, up to 30%, uh, down to 30% of the matching as soon as the risk goes down. It's, as I mentioned, it, it encourages partnership between uh, international groups. Uh, it lets the private sector choose the winners. It's not the government that decides who the best companies are. They select uh, groups that then select the winners um, in the industry. There's a very, very focus on innovation. They don't want to crowd out the market, so they look at what is the gap they have to bridge, and they focus on bridging the specific gap uh, where the risk is higher. They don't want to just invest money when there's no, when there's no risk. Um, and the other thing which is very important is they, they leave the upside to investors. They understand that for investors to come into uh, things like that, they have to keep the upside to the investor, not touch it, and they give sometimes downside protection for the investors. So that's a really great way on how to incentivize investors to come in and keep them the, the upside. So this is a little bit about the government. Uh, I won't go into details here just to show you that it's pretty uh, complicated process. They have money for a lot of different uh, groups. They invest about $400 million every year in the, uh, in, in the Israeli economy. By the way, that's not such a huge number for a population of 9 million people, but it's very, very significant and it brings a lot of uh, uh, outcome out of it. Um, so you see here some of the technology. So it's, it's very, very, uh, very variegated for each sector. They have a, a, a different program. And it's really a matter of evolving. So it evolves every time they see a need, they bring up a new program, which I think is, is very important. So I want to, to take our example to give you a little bit of, of, a, a, of a taste of how it works and how it can help the economy. So we are a venture fund, early stage venture fund. Uh, we have this unique approach, which is a six to one matching that we get from the government, 85%. And we have 25 companies in our portfolio, mostly in digitalization, uh, clean energy, healthcare, IoT, and big data. Um, and about seven years ago, we were selected by the Israeli Innovation Authority, by the government, to run one of our incubators. It's a very, very competitive process. You can see at the bottom there uh, some of the other companies that won the process. So you can see we have uh, Philips, Boston Scientific, IBM, uh, Medtronic, Nielsen, Teva. These are huge conglomerates that decided to come to Israel to make investment, and they were very, very attracted by this great matching mechanism that the government uh, put up. How does it work? So it's, it's quite simple. I mean, basically, the, the government takes out all the risk in the early stage. We put up only $100,000 plus some of the expenses of the incubator. The government matches that with 600 k for every company, every investment we do. And the beauty of the system is that we get all the upside. So we get 
usually 20-25% of the company just for the 100K because, of course, the company sees the whole 700, so it's like a typical seed investment. Um, and then the government will only get repaid through a 3% royalties out of sales. So only if and when the company is successful and starts selling the product, they'll start giving back 3% of the sales to the government. So it's a great way, really, to reduce significantly our risk at the beginning and get paid only if and when the company is successful. So it's a really partnership between the private and the public sector, where actually, in this case, the public sector takes most of the risk of the initial stage investment, which is very brave. But it's a model that works very well. What does it do to our model? So we see, this is Israel, we see about 6,700 deals per year from, uh, only from Israel in our fields. What we do is we do the first selection. We select about four or five companies out of the 6,700, so less than 1% of the companies that come to us were selected to go into the incubator. And again, at this stage, we put very little money. We put just 100K plus some expenses. That's where the government brings us the, the big funding. And then we work with them for 18 months. So it's a real incubator. It's a place where our team sits with, uh, with all, the, all the companies. And we really help them bring the product to development, to the, bit, to the market. Uh, so it's a really very intense program. But by doing that, we also really know the company very well. Usually when you do any seed investment, you know, you, maybe you come to the board. It's not a very intense process, and you don't get a lot of, uh, I would say, quality time with entrepreneurs. In our case, we actually live with them 18 months, with the good days, the bad days of the entrepreneurs. So you really get to know the people you're investing in. And then the second stage is much easier, because then you really know if the company is good or bad, and that's where we put most of the money. So basically the idea is, you know, we, the government helps us in investing in many companies in early stage. Thanks to them, we, we're putting much more money in the initial, much more, sorry, we invest in many more companies at the initial stage, and we help them a lot, so the success rate of the first companies is much higher because we bring a lot of value into the process. And also in terms of our investors, you know, the money that is invested in the companies, most of the money is actually invested only after we see them for 18 months. So it's a really good way to get to know the entrepreneurs and understand where to invest most of the money that we put in. By the way, the government continues with the matching, but as I mentioned before, the matching goes down. So in the second stage, it's one-to-one -one matching. First stage is six to one, the second one is 50-50 because of course the risk has gone down and so there's less need for the government to intervene. So that's how the model works. By the way, just to give you an idea in terms of what is the impact on the economy of this program. So in the last four years, we got about $12 million from the government in the early stage. So we, uh, we invested in 20 companies. Those 20 companies in the last four years have raised more than $100 million. So the company invested $12 million and our companies raised $100 million which of course all went into the economy. So just in the last four, and by the way, these companies are still growing, so they'll raise much more money. So just in terms of the, of the multiple, they had a multiple of eight to 10 times of the money that was invested by the government. So it's a really good investment because of course most of this money goes back to the government through taxes and uh, payroll, et cetera. You can see here that basically because of the system, we get really nice, um, upseek for our value, so this is an investor view. In the second stage, you see, we continue to invest in the company, so the grade goes up, but the value that was created for our part was big, so you see all the blue is basically the valuation of our stake in all the companies goes up a lot, which brought us to have a net IRR of more than 30% for investors, which is, of course, a pretty good achievement. Uh, a little bit about the sectors we invest in, so, I think that some of them are, are, very, are very suitable here. What we do is really we try to uh, use some of the best technologies that we have in Israel, IoT, big data, AI, robotics, and to use them in a little bit more conservative industries. So we've taken them sometimes from other sectors and apply them in all the sectors you see here. Uh, you know, agri-tech, transportation, construction, retail, etc. And the idea is really that we believe all these sectors and 
this is a great example in this conference, all these sectors are really ripe for innovation. It's if you make it well, you can, these are huge markets, so if you can make it well, you can really become a very big company by focusing on them, but it's still early stage. So we, the valuations are not very high because most of the investors are not yet focused on these uh, companies, but we believe that by taking them at the right moment, we're a bit at the inflection point, and that's really where the value will come up. And I have to say, we see it in our company fielding, for example, that you know, investing at the right time, the company now is growing much faster than most of the other companies, which are much more IT-based. So if you, if you have the right product into the market, then you can really sell it very quickly, even in a conservative industry like agriculture. And this is uh, the rest of the portfolio. So as you can see, we invested in uh, digitalization, what I mentioned before. We have uh, quite a lot of energy and clean tech companies in our portfolio and also a few healthcare uh, companies. So that's a quite a diversified portfolio. And it's very important to have a diversified portfolio because at any given time, you know, one of the markets can be in distress. So it's good to have a good uh, diversification also on the portfolio level. So I, I, I actually, after yesterday night uh, uh, chat we had uh, with some of, some of you guys, I, I put up some, some thoughts of things that could be done here in South Australia or could be learned from the Israeli model, et cetera. And, uh, and I think as, as you might have understood by now, it's, it's not about one thing. I mean, there have to be quite a few factors to make a full ecosystem work. Uh, I think government can really play a big role into it, but it has to be a role, not just money. I mean, it has to be more of a role of education. You, know, to, you probably won't get the same culture as we have in Israel. This comes from many, many different factors. But it's very important to try and, and put, even in the school level, a, a, an idea of entrepreneurship, of bringing new ideas, et cetera. So it really comes from the very early stage. In Israel, we have a lot of programs for young kids from the age of 12 to 16 to make their own idea, make their own startup. So I think it's something that can be also used here to increase the, the level of entrepreneurship. And so that's one side, and of course, uh, what I mentioned before, give the people a chance to, to fail. I don't know how you do it on a government level, but that's very important, you know, to, to let the people really try as many times as possible and give them then a second chance. That's critical for a uh, startup ecosystem to be built. And of course, money. I mean, I described in uh, what Israel is doing for the, uh, Israeli government is doing for the ecosystem. It's not a lot of money, by the way. As I mentioned, it's $400 million out of the budget, which is, I think, uh, $100 billion. So it's maybe you know 4% of the budget or something like that. No, less than that, sorry. It's uh, half a percent of the budget. So not much money. And of course, the return, as I mentioned, can be 10 times the money invested into the economy. So it's very, very important to do it. Of course, in, do it properly. And uh, one of the things to do it properly is really to learn from the experience of others. We have many, many different countries that tried all kinds of different models, so it's great to see, to learn from what all the others have done, and of course, apply it in the, in the best way uh, for Southern Australia. The other thing which is important and was critical for the, um, for the Israeli model was attracting international experience. You know, attracting the multinational companies, attracting experts, and also bringing back your expert. I understand a lot of Australians go out to the US or other places, and not all of them come back. That's a really critical way to bring back uh, the best talent, uh, because they bring all the expertise from the foreign country, and they bring it back to really enrich the way uh, the country here is done. So again, we also Israel tries to do it. It's not easy. We also have a lot of people uh, moving out to, to the US, but most of them then come back because of family, because of uh, opportunities, et cetera. That's a critical point to really improve the way uh, we do it. Uh, lastly, you know, it's a long process. It's not also in Israel, it hasn't come overnight. You have to start somewhere to, you know, hopefully in the next 10 years, 15 years to become also maybe a small startup nation. But we have to start in order to, for the process to, to be. Um, I just want to finish with a little bit of a few words about agriculture. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of you will, uh, will be interested. So this is a little bit about the, the ecosystem in Israel. 
Uh, we have about 400 companies that are working in the ecosystem. As you can see, quite different uh, uh, applications. And between them, also, there's a lot of diversification on pretty much any topic touched by agriculture. The money that goes into the field is about $200 million. So compared to the $8 billion that I mentioned, it's not high. So you know, if, if people are complaining here there's not enough money, in Israel also, in agriculture, there's not that much money. Um, and really, people have to struggle a bit to find the money because most of the money goes to you know, AI, automotive, uh, cyber, et cetera. So it's a fight also in Israel. But it's a really nice ecosystem that is building up. In our specific fund, we have two companies that are uh, in the field. One is presenting here, so I won't go too much into detail. It's filled in. Uh, but I think an important part of filled in is that it was started by farmers. So we had uh, basically two, one farmer that connected to his friend was an entrepreneur. So they brought both a really good deep technology, uh, deep industry expertise with the entrepreneurship and the IT on the other side. And the combination of the two was really a big success because they could really produce a product which is really suitable for their uh, final customers, create a great relationship with farmers, and then improve the products all the time. And now they're selling into the US, mostly in California, in Israel, and from last year here in Australia. So we're very happy to be here, and I think it's growing very nicely. Um, the other one we have, it's much earlier stage. It's called Aruga. They actually built a robot for uh, pollination, pruning, uh, and monitoring of uh, tomatoes in greenhouses. Uh, also, this company, by the way, started in Israel, but because you have here in Australia a big problem of importing animals, including bees, we decided to actually have a second market here in Australia. So actually, out of the two companies in agriculture we have, both are working here, which I think is a good sign, because it means that the market here, even we are, if we are quite far from you guys, it's, it's such an interesting market, such nice and good people and good partners, that we can bring a lot of people here to, again, with the expertise to really uh, build uh, the ecosystem also here. Um, and lastly, uh, I just want to share some of the lessons. And I mentioned, you know, we make a lot of mistakes. We try not to make new mistakes. Well, sorry, we try to make new mistakes, not old mistakes. So we try to teach, you know, everybody what old mistake we did so that you don't do it uh, yourself. So lesson learned from working in agriculture. The first one, as I mentioned, is you really need to know the industry well. You really need to know the farmers well, to talk to the farmers all the time, because at the end of the day, they are the, the, the buyers of your product. It's even more important than in other industry, where you might imagine what the customer will know. In this case, it's very important to know what they really want, and it's not obvious sometimes. Uh, bring a simple solution to a current product. There's a lot of companies doing you know, amazing AI, big data, drones, but you know, things that might have an impact on the farmer three years from now, or maybe on, a, on some, some niche thing that he doesn't really care. So it's very important to understand from the farmer what is the specific pain he has now, and find a good and simple solution for this product. And make it simple, meaning extremely, extremely friendly, user-friendly, with a really good uh, user interface, user experience, that's critical. By the way, you know, the guy that's fielding at the beginning, they made a product which was not really rocket science, but it was so well produced, so well packaged for the farming industry that they were selling it like, uh, um, you know, extremely fast. Um, the other thing which is important is you have to create value for all stakeholders. You know, sometimes when you sell a product, you focus on one of the, I don't know, the farmer or the worker or the, or the ag agronomist. It's very important to understand what each of these stakeholders uh, can bring, can get value out of it, talk to them to understand how to make the product as good as possible for all of them and not just for the, for the key buyer. Um, the other thing we learned is that you want to get to, if you have many crops that you're working on, it's best to focus on the crop with the highest relative value for the customer. You know, you might have crops that are much, much bigger, but you might be only, I don't know, half a percent uh, impacting half a percent of their cost structure, eh, not interesting enough. If you can actually impact 30% of its cost structure or increase significantly the yield, even if it's a smaller market, 
it's much better to start with that because then it's much easier to penetrate the market and then you probably can go and, and conquer also the other crops. But it's very important to find the crop that has the much the highest value for specific uh, product you're building. As I mentioned, build the product with the customers. Um, you know, sometimes it's a bit tricky because you talk to a lot of customers and they want everything, you know, 25 different features. So at the end, of course, you have to focus, select the features that you want to develop in your product and build those and then, you know, maybe the others build with time. But you have to really talk to all the customers to understand what it's really needed in the product. And by the way, sometimes what you think is the killer app is definitely not a killer app. And they will tell you what is the killer app. Because the, you know, your thinking and their thinking is different. They leave the, the farm every day. So it's very important to understand. And sometimes it's really simple thing which you haven't thought about. But by talking to customers, you understand that that's a really uh, good thing. And they'll buy the product for that. I mean, all the other things are good, but they'll buy it just for this specific uh, application. Uh, another thing which we found very important is to create key references. So really invest in your customer, build a strong relationship with them. They will be the best reference for, for the other uh, customers. But it has to be per geography. It's very difficult to get you know, a farmer from the US talking to an Israeli farmer. Forget it. In each country, in each geography, you have to build a really good one or two customers that will talk to the other customers, build your brand, and they will be your best marketing guys. I mean, once you've done that, you're, you're in good shape. The other thing is once you get into a customer, which you know, it's a very difficult process to really win a customer, but once you are in, you meaning that you sold to him and you create this relationship, you, haven't, you have to not to stop the relationship, invest a lot in the relationship, because again, they are great reference, but you can also upsell and cross-sell to them and build the new products that you want to build together with them. Once you're in, it's much easier to sell them new products, to build with them the right new products. So it's very, very important to invest in the customers also after they sign with you. So that's the thing. So I think I'm done. I hope it was interesting enough for you. And I'll be happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you very much.